Okay. So we are here to talk about 514. It's hard to believe it's been a year ago. And now, one year later, we want to talk about hope and healing. What are your hopes and how do we continue to heal? Because it's not overnight. Uh, you know, I think part of the healing is in the remembrance. Um, I think back to the, the Holocaust and how uh, the Jews have never uh, stopped remembering and not just stop remembering, but have put action into how do we change things. And, and I think that that's so important that we don't forget. Well, there's always hope, um, you know, for those of us who are, are believers in God, you know, our hope is, is grounded in our faith. But I think our hope is also in each other. I think one of the, the great stories that came out of 514 was the resilience of the community that uh, uh, while the event was catastrophic, heartbreaking, traumatic, uh, the people in the community, the residents, uh, I'm just so in awe of their courage, uh, their tenacity, uh, their willingness to, to help and respond to, with one another. I think sometimes, you know, the narrative kind of shifted a lot about a lot of people coming into community helping folks. And I think that kind of overshadowed a little bit of the people who were already in that community who were looking out for one another. And so, um, you know, my hope is really grounded in, in the people there. They're just fantastic human beings um, who, who, in a tragic situation, uh, allowed that tragic situation to, to reveal the best of who they were as opposed to, you know, the other side. So that's where my hope lies. Okay. Um, I have to concur with uh, Pastor uh, Nicholas. Um, our hope uh, lies in the unification of that community. Um, I think that it not didn't just bring the 1428 together, but it brought the city together as a whole. And it also brought an awareness to the need you know, of individuals in that particular community that, you know, are in drastic need for resources. And um, I think that that awareness uh, made it important for us to come together, you know, all facets, you know, of city government as well as community leadership. So uh, the hope is in the continuation, you know, of us coming together, you know, as a people. And you all bring kind of a different perspective to the table. You boots on the ground with Mad Dads, City Hall, obviously, and health equity issues. Um, what if we learned a year later as far as what our community is made of and also the issues that are really still at the core? You know, I think that one, I mean, it's many lessons, it's so many lessons, I don't even think you can count because what came out of that day and what um, what we learned is, number one, that this community is stronger than what many people thought. Um, their voices were and are very, very loud and being paid attention to uh, across this country. And I think another thing, although Buffalo is highly segregated, highly segregated still to this day, um, is that we learned how much better we are together. And when those voices uh, collectively work together. We got the attention of the President of the United States, the Vice President of the United States. Uh, some of the top clergy, I'll go to clergy, of the United States have been here and continue to call. I talked to one yesterday um, and saying, what else can we do? Um, I think we learned really how powerful we are as a people. And, and, and uh, while your premise of your question, I think, is, is accurate, but in terms of us coming from different spaces, but uh, all three of us are rooted in our unapologetic love for our people. Mm -hmm. That's a fact. You know, and, and that, you know, all of us, while we are uh, champion uh, diversity and, and people from all uh, ethnicities and backgrounds coming together as one, but we do so with an unapologetic love for black people. And I think that's, that's something that's very, very important because this incident, was an attack upon the black community and black people, right? And it wasn't a random type of thing that happened. This was something that was targeted. And 
And so what do we learn about this? Well, I mean, we learned that um, a lot of people were surprised. So I'll speak for myself. When I heard it, I saw it, I, somebody was there, was calling me real time. And there was a part of me that wasn't surprised, you know, and, and, and afterwards I kind of had to reflect upon that. Like, it was shocking the event, but the fact that it happened in this country didn't shock me because of the history of the, of the struggle for our, and our people, for our people to be safe. Um, I think that the, the, the best way to get to the point of healing is to acknowledge uh, the reality of the condition, right? So I, I, I'm hopeful that, and I'm optimistic, that uh, this event will, will cast a light upon some issues, root cause issues that, that you know, Kenny and Darius and I, myself and others in the community have been screaming about for decades, yeah. right? And I quite frankly have had some real tepid responses from other elements of our community. Uh, and now I'm hoping that through this event and what was exposed when people came into community who hadn't come into the community in the past and really saw, wow, what's going on here, that they'll, that they'll understand that there are some serious structural issues that are going on, that have gone on in generations. And we need the, the kind of, as, as, as Darius was talking about, this kind of universal uh, support, coalition building. Because if, in fact, we had the, the power within to kind of by ourselves, well, we would have fixed it by now. Right, right. So it's not, it's not from our lack of effort, but, but we need the community, uh, and I'm talking about the community as a big C, you know, corporate, uh, political, uh, all kinds of places to come and, and really make this, this revitalization and resurgence of this community a priority for this region. Kenny, I know you are boots on the ground, and to Pete's question, and even with what um, we heard um, George just say, is that the attitude on the ground? Well, We're not going to apologize. Well, well, you know, I'm. You know, when you say boots on the ground, you know, I'm boots on the ground, but I operate, you know, in a lot of different capacities. I also work in city government, you know, and I'm also a pastor in the community. Actually, this is my bishop, and this is my first mentor, you know, and still is my mentor. And um, one thing that that I have learned. Um, is that, um, and I don't want to say it in the wrong way, but it shouldn't have oh, taken. Just say it the way you say it. <laughs> it, 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 it <laughs> I, I, I just, I've learned, you know, uh, uh, to see hypocrisy at a higher level than I've ever saw it in my life. You know, it shouldn't take uh, 10, you know, black people to get killed. You know, I grew up on uh, Jefferson and um, I, I used to, you know, create a lot of mayhem right there when that was a lot, you know. I used to hustle on that corner, so I grew up on Jefferson, and Jefferson, you know, has always been a place of disparity. You know, there's always been people hurting on Jefferson ever since I came to Buffalo in 1986, and, you know, I was just, and I talked to uh, my bishop, and I talked to Dr. Nicholas all the time. It just didn't make sense to me, you know, that 10 people, you know, three of them I knew personally, right, uh, at a store that I frequent, had I not been in Pittsburgh at that time, when we finished doing outreach on the corner of Maine and Utica, myself and my two daughters, we always go to that Tops because they love the chicken. Mm -hmm. So they want drumsticks. We would have been in the store at that time, right? And so um, the, 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 the truth of the matter is that, you know, why does it take, you know, tragedy for people to, you know, become aware of what's needed in, in the community that we serve you know, every day. And so for me, you know, um, a year later, you know, um, media from all over the world is going to descend on Jefferson Avenue. And what's going to happen after the weekend? Pastor Nicholas, my bishop and myself will be on Jefferson Avenue again alone, you know. So what I've learned is that it, 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 it should take more, you know, than something as heinous as that to happen for people to realize that, that there is a strong need for a lot of resources, you know, right here in my community. So I've learned how hypocritical things can be, you know, um, when tragedy takes place. And so we're going to go from that hypocritical, that H, to that hope. 
because now we are a year later and we've been talking about this for the last year and the hurt is still there. I mean, H just keeps going, right? The hurt. The hurt, the hate, the anger. But we do need hope. Oh my God. We well, I believe hope. we have hope and hope is what we're doing right now. Absolutely. Hope is, you know, you taking, you know, the initiative, uh, Claudine, to actually, you know, talk about it, right? You have hope when you have the bishop here, you know, who has maximized resources to bring to the community. You have hope when you have Dr. Nicholas talking about health disparities. You have hope when you have Cold Spring Bible Chapel, you know, opening up the facility, you know, to, to feed the hungry and, you know, clothe the naked. And so the hope is that we have come together, you know, and we have broke denominational barriers, right? Um, we have, you know, broken religious barriers, you know, and the hope is that we have come together 365 days later. We're still out there, you know, uh, not trying to make a difference, but making a difference. So the hope is in the help that's here and that's going to be consistent in what we do. What needs to happen to make sure <clears throat> that hope doesn't turn into frustration? and people don't get impatient because you drive down Jefferson Avenue and a lot of people might look around and say, nothing's changed. A year later, we've got the tops reopened, but nothing's changed. What, what do, you, you, do, you, do you say to the people in your congregations to say, we need patience and we need hope? And how do you, how do you keep the frustration at bay? People are tired. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I would say consistency. Um, you know, to come in, and I've always said this, you know, what happens after the cameras are off? Right. Um, and that consistency, and that consistency, whether we like it or not, is an, on the shoulders, a big part of leaders. Um, you know, everybody's, the, the president isn't going to answer the phone for everybody. Will he answer the phone for the mayor? Will he answer the phone for certain people? He will, or somebody will. And I think it is about that consistency from here, from, from right here um, to there, because after tops, other tragedies happen. What makes us unique is that the other tragedies didn't have a white supremacist who openly said, I'm coming to kill black people. That, that makes us unique over the school shootings, which are horrible and, and horrific, but we're unique. But if there isn't that consistency to say beyond one year, because after, you know, a few weeks after the, the light kind of dimmed from Buffalo, after the first year, it's going to dim even more. And if something, and that's why, and, and I'm not patronizing uh, the Holocaust. I think that the, that example of keeping it on the front burner, of, of making sure we do not forget, but not just having a, a memorial or a remembrance, how do you turn that into uh, economic development? How do you turn that? Because right now, everybody's comfortable saying black people. Everybody's comfortable saying white supremacists. But will that go away? We have to be, we, all of us, anybody who God has allowed, media, everybody has to keep that level of energy in order for that level, uh, energy and synergy, in order for that level to return and make a difference um, at the end of the day. If not, that light dims, another tragedy happens. And out of tragedy, we've seen changes since, you know, written history, um, you know, the most tragic events often bring change. But if, if it's not consistent, people will just say it happened and I can't see any change. Right. And what about race relations? Um, I know after this happened, Pete and I, we, we had open conversations and we just talked about, you know, things in black and white. I'm black, he's white. And the hurt really was the same because we come from that same, we're, we're city people, we get it, you know, that's not what we want. How are you helping people heal when it comes to race relations? Because we saw some people, we got to see the true colors of some people. Let's not, let's be clear. There are some people out here who, they don't care about black people. And there are some black people who don't care about white people. But that we know, biblically, that's not the way it's supposed to be. Well, I mean, it's how we define caring. So, um, and I'm not to belittle or to diminish any type of cross-racial events that all of us have attended mm -hmm. where we get black people and white people together and we'll sit in circles and have conversations and pray together. And I think those things have value. I think they do. However, um, caring 
has to be demonstrated through investment. Not only investment of, of resources, but of emotions, of time. And when I think about May 14th um, and those 10 people who were, who were brutally murdered on that day, but every day I'm experiencing people who are dying uh, before they should from diabetes, from hypertension, from cancer, from all kinds of chronic diseases that are disproportionately ravishing the black community. And we've documented that. And if you would take just the median age of funerals of the three of us, and then if you were to put three white clergy up here mm. and do the median age of the funerals that they do, you would see a very stark difference. We're constantly, I, I speak for myself, but I'm assuming that we're constantly doing funerals for people in their 40s, in their 50s, 30s. Teens. teens. Yeah, right. And not because they were hit by buses or shot or something, because they died of, you know, diabetes or heart disease, right? And, and, and this is what is consistently happening in our community. So the caring, the, the, the sense of, we talk about people caring. Well then, the caring has to be uh, demonstrated through prioritizing the issues, the everyday issues that black people are facing in this city that are causing us to be sicker, to, to die sooner, to have our families disrupted. I mean, when you do a funeral of a mother who's in her 40 and you see her four or five kids out there and you know what I mean? It, the disruption that occurs, right, is, is just, it multiplies. So the caring has to be demonstrated not only in coming to events, right, where we'll talk about racism or come to services where we'll have ecumenical or interfaith services about it, but it's in using, influencing your circle to engage in issues or solutions and partnering with us on how do we, we, we change this. It's, it's schools, you know, we, they, they, we did a story, they did a story about black children being four grade levels behind, right? So caring is not calling us and say, hey man, I read that article, that's terrible. Yeah, we know, right? So how do we get resources? How do we make shifts on, on root cause things and we need that kind of cross-racial, cross-sector kind of coalition, right, that, we, that would have the impact. And so that's when I, you know, so I'm not trying to be callous about the caring, but, but I'm kind of at this space of my journey now that the caring has to align itself with some definitive action or commitment to, to really partner with us on solving some of these problems. And, and, and for me, um, I understand, you know, the kumbaya, the, you know, the whites and, the, you know, the blacks, you know, getting together and, you know, kind of, you know, breaking down, you know, racial barriers. But for me, um, that tragic event made us realize as black people the importance of caring for one another. Right. Um, that right there brought an awareness, you know, especially when, you know, we're out on the streets, you know, and, and we're in the different corridors of the city, you know, to uh, talk to our people and let them know the importance of looking out for one another, the importance of caring for one another and even our young men and young women, the importance of stop killing one another and stop, you know, hurting one another. Because if we can have someone, you know, drive a hundred miles from, you know, where they live at to come in here, you know, and have a mindset to kill as many of us as he can, we shouldn't have that mindset ourselves, you know. And so, you know, from, from my, um, you know, platform, you know, as a pastor, as a youth pastor for 15 years, but as a senior pastor, you know, under Bishop and Full Gospel, my message to my people is this should have made us think more about how we should care for one another, how we should be concerned more for one another. You know, if people are hunting us, we shouldn't be hunting ourselves. You know, if people are trying to destroy us, we shouldn't destroy ourselves, you know. And so the caring first starts at home.
You know, Jesus told his disciples, start in Jerusalem, you know, start at home. Before we go out to Samaria and Judea and the other post, uttermost parts of the world, we need to start home. We need to start caring for one another, being concerned about, you know, your brothers and being concerned about your sisters. And also, you know, I have, I have some uh, Caucasian friends that, that are dear to me you know, and um, we had to diffuse, you know, uh, a, a lot of, you know, uh, mindsets of our young people who just, that just made them really hate white people, you know, really hate, you know, uh, white police officers to the point where they were planning rebellions. Like they wanted to like, you know, we gonna go out, you know, in Amherst, we gonna do something. And no, you're not because, you know, um, as civilized people and, and as godly people, you know, you know, it's our job to teach that hate from any level, from any area, from any angle is wrong, but we first have to stop hating ourselves as a people. So that's, you know, um, where for me, where caring starts, you know, it starts with us and then we can begin to, you know, care about, you know, other people, you know, ethnicists, not saying that we don't, but for me, you know, my concern, like uh, George saying, like, you know, um, or my bishop, you know, I unapologetically, you know, love my people, and, and, that, and that's a, a concern, you know. I love all people, but, you know, I, I, I'm, you love I, yourself. I love myself, yeah. absolutely. And in a lot of ways, that's what that psychopath was hoping for. He was hoping to touch yep. off a race war. Yep. He was hoping to have that response and tear not only the black people apart, but the whole community apart. Mm -hmm. And uh, that, that love and caring for each other kind of diffused that and defeated that in a way. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, that goes to say for him and whoever was behind it too, because he acted, but I think as we heard um, Garnell Whitfield say, there are others behind that trigger who have that same belief. As we get ready to wrap up, I just wanted to know, as pastors, do you still have sleepless nights over this? I, I, so I don't, I don't have sleepless nights. Um, I think that I'm, I haven't uh, taken care of me yet because my responsibility, whether it's as a pastor or as a uh, elected official is to take care of everybody else. Um, so even as we approach this uh, one year mark, I really don't know where to be. Um, so it's really hard to help them to be, I, I'm not, we talk about memorials, I don't know where to be mentally in that space. So I've been rather quiet. I mean, even the week, this week that's coming up, um, I don't know where I'll be. And I mean, physically, I'm really not interested in being in a lot of places. I'm not interested in being in front of a lot of cameras. We did that. Um, and the work begins, you know, here we have now healing circles because I had to bring in another agency and they're here every week, once a week, um, for mental health. So that question, you know, when we, <laughs> come on, I forgot the question now. No, but I mean, yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I'm, I'm oh, to sleep that, at night, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And we brought in, a, you know, one thing is we, in our congregation, we brought in a lot of things about mindfulness mm -hmm. and, and things that, you know, maybe it's a little unorthodox within the Christian context, but, uh, healing um, I mean we'll you know we'll do the music and the prayer and the shout mm -hmm. and stuff but we uh, one thing we learned is is there's that that quiet mm -hmm. time of healing uh, we need to do that as, yeah. uh, as well so mm -hmm. um, Lord, I know you were there yeah. no no you you helped me because I but no I, I, I say what I say I, I don't know where I'm at so night yeah. nighttime is not the my worst time is is my life is when I'm awake mm -hmm. Um, you know, I, and I'll say this, and I, I have disappointment, and I think I'm just going to express that. Because when we talked about the, the races and everybody coming together, you know, what this one thing, and I know this isn't part of the question, showed me is that the ecumenical services I've had with so many people who didn't say anything. Mm -hmm. And I'm talking about other pastors she didn't say a word. who pastor people that look like me. and. Not one phone call, not yeah. one show up at right. anything. Like they had to protect their whiteness. Yes. And, and I'm just gonna say it, I have to say, say it. it because it's the one thing that bothered me so much. There were so many people who came, but I wanna assure you there were so many people who didn't come mm -hmm. and who didn't acknowledge a white supremacist in their pulpits, mm -hmm. ever. Mm -hmm. And if they did, it was so quick. 
while we're still living with it. Yet I got pastors in New York City who call like once a month and say, come on the radio show, let's do this. Let's, can we bring more food? What can we do? So my sleepless nights, really because I didn't know so many people around me and in neighboring communities, just didn't give a damn. Yeah. And We're dismissive. They just, you know, they wanted to isolate it on this young man and not talk about the things that yeah. influenced this young yeah. man. And some of those things that influence that young man are some of the things that are promoted in some of these churches. And I'm gonna say it, yep. okay? So, you know, I mean, white supremacy is not only a supro uh, uh, promoted on the internet. <laughs> there, there's, 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 there's this sense uh, that, that, that has really infected, infected the Christian movement. Yes. And to, and, and, and I hear you, you know, and there's some folks that just don't want to acknowledge that element of, of what happened May 14th because it, it challenges their narrative yes, yes, about yes. this country and about what goes on in these churches and in some of their churches and some of the things and some of the people yep. that they support, right? And so, yeah, I, I mean, and that, I'm sure that's not what you got us on here talking <laughs> right. about, but, but that's- This and, is but, the root of it. We, we, we can't have healing unless we have those conversations. Real and, conversations. And, I, and, and I'm tired of folks projecting on us what we need in order right. to heal. And then when we tell Absolutely. you this is what we need to heal, then we say, well, I don't know. We don't, we don't right. do I don't want to touch right. that. <laughs> and so there's a lot of that goes on. And I know we, I'm not trying to be negative, but there's been a lot of projecting upon black people from this and, and, and a lot of assumptions and a lot of, 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 of trying to get us to see things their way, yeah. right? Or, or get to the point where the healing is centered around the comfort of white people right and, and as opposed to the healing that's centered on the comfort and protection of black people that's a sermon right that's and and yeah. and we got i mean we'll come back and, talk, and unpack that but i'm telling you and that's what a lot of these events have been about it's about white folks feeling comfortable about what happened and and and, and being able to just you know we did our part and 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 and, and now we can we can move on uh, well, no, we're still living in it. No, that, that, you know, all, you know, and, I, that's and, and so saying. that's a that's a conversation that we we got to have, um, and we're willing to have it, uh, but but we got to have it in a place where we're we can be our authentic selves in that space. I yeah. think we so appreciate mm -hmm. that you are so open and candid now, because even though we're talking about hope and healing, um, there's enough here to um, unpack and do a lot more with but we can't ignore what was said because it is the truth, it's reality. And we're sitting here, we're living it. Yeah. But I think we also realize that while we have hope, the healing continues. Exactly. And for me, um, going in at Tops, there was a person that you know I kind of grew up with a little bit older than me, um, Hayward Patterson. Mm. We called him Teeny, because yeah. he was big. Yeah. And, um, Every time I would go into that store because he know my past and my background, he would always encourage me, you know, keep doing it, Pastor. You know, we appreciate you, Pastor. You know, um, keep preaching the word, keep helping our youth, you know. And so for me, it's not so many, you know, uh, sleepless nights. It's, it, it's a lot of days of unsurety. Mm -hmm. You know, where do we go next, you know? Um, um, like, like Pastor Nicholas said, you know, we had a lot of people that, you know, came, you know, in our community, but the resources that were promised, you know, the businesses that were, you know, supposed to, you know, come into our community, you know, um, the things that were said, you know, that were needed, you know, it, I'm unsure if that was just something just to pacify us at the time, you know, just to calm black folks down because, you know, for three weeks, four weeks, five weeks, six weeks, you have premier restaurants coming out on Jefferson, feeding them, you know, we're gonna feed them, we're gonna give them a couple of t-shirts, we're gonna give them some hats and we wanna, you know, calm them down, you know. Now, you know, that the dust settled, you know, when we, you know, find ourselves, you know, in the anniversary weekend, there's gonna be a lot of emotions 
you know, that's going to resurface, you know. A lot of anger, you know what I'm saying, is going to resurface. You know, those young men who were standing on Laurel and Jefferson and those men that frequent, you know, that parking lot and the people, you know, who heard those shots, you know, from streets away. As we begin to talk about what happened, a lot of feelings are going to come up. And so for me, you know, there's un some unsurety, you know. There's going to be a lot of speeches, you know, a lot of bell ringing, you know, a lot of hem hawing, but, but, but. But what's next? You know, I, 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 I um, have, you know, a lot of unsurety, you know, in my day, not in my night. And I think about, you know, Teeny, you know, all the time. You know, I think of when, when I, you know, pull up to Todd, he would be there because he was a jitney. <laughs> you know, right. but he also was a deacon yes, and he always had an encouraging word, you know, and that and that's missing. You know, that's missing to see, you know, I call uh, Officer Salter A+, plus. you know what I'm saying? W when you walk in there, hey, what up, A+, plus? you know, th th that's missing, you know. So I'm kind of, you know, you know, in, 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 a, in a place of, you know, what's next? And those things can't be replaced. Can't be replaced. Right, so the, the, the things, be, be, people be very clear, the gifts that were, were taken from yeah. us, there'll be other people that will do similar things, right? But things... They're just, you can't just, they're not interchangeable parts. Nope. Right? And so, and I think people, I, I would just prayerful that people really understand that and, and, and trust. You know, it, why can't they trust people like Bishop Prison and myself, like they trust the Bagulas or trust Elon Musk and give us billion. I take some. And and let us <laughs> let us go to work yeah. with so cuz one of the challenges is is a lot of times people ask, "Hey, you know, how can we turn it around? How can we change it? What is needed over there?" And then when we're honest about what's really needed, then they they make you beg for the resources uh to do the to 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 fulfill the very question they asked you. So if you, if you don't want the answer, don't ask me, right? It, because we'll give you an answer and then, and you know, the resources will be here if we want to get it. And then they'll say, well, no, but we can't do that. We can give you this. But then you see other folk, you know, get whatever they want, <laughs> right? And so when are we going to be a priority? When, when, are, when are you going to match what you do with what you say? You say you care. Okay, I get it. So you care, but then, and then we get, you know, and I, I feel bad for you at times because then you got to face folks and, 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 and instead of being able to say, hey, this is what we're going to be able to do, you can say, well, <laughs> you know. <laughs> we're asking. Yeah, right, we're right. We're begging. Right. I just left a meeting. Right, 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 right. <laughs> and, and we're working on it. And we're, you know what I mean? And, and they're trying their very best, right? And, 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 then, and then you got to go back and say, well, we didn't really get everything we, we, you needed, we needed, but this is what we got. And it's never enough. We want to thank you guys so much, men, for being here to talk about this. Um, and I don't know where we will be on that actual day. I, I'll be working, but I'll tell you, it's going to be a moment of reflection. Like, I don't want to really deal with people. Yeah, I understand. Neither do I. But thank you so much. Right. <laughs> I wish we had unless we, in, unless we stay in the house. Hope continues and we need openness and also honesty mm -hmm. from the entire community, the white community especially. Mm -hmm. Honestly, why isn't this happening? Because it's going to take a whole community investment because the whole community will reap the benefits of if we can get things figured out and pulled together.